Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. First at four, new signs of grief at Oxford High School as even more hearts are breaking. Today, a fourth student has died from the wounds he suffered in a place we all hoped he would be safe. And the 15-year-old suspect accused of ending those four young lives goes to court facing charges of murder, charged as an adult just 24 hours after prosecutors say he fired his weapon at the school. Good afternoon, I'm Devin Skillian. Karen is uh, on assignment first at four. We've just received the newest information about the shooting at Oxford High School. The Oakland County prosecutor has announced charges against 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly teenager faces several charges, including four counts of first degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder. The prosecutor says it is possible that additional charges may be issued, including charges against both parents. Prosecutor Karen McDonald also talked about why they charged the shooter as an adult. I want to explain why we are charging this suspect as an adult in this case. First, the seriousness of the crime this person committed under Michigan law. There are crimes that the legislature has said are so serious that a person who commits them can automatically be charged as an adult. First degree murder is the most serious of all those crimes. Second, there are facts leading up in the shooting that suggest this was not just an impulsive act. Those, are facts, those facts are not appropriate for discussion right now because it could affect the prosecution of this case. Lastly, charging this person as an adult is necessary to achieve justice and protect the public. Again, that arraignment is getting underway. We will have more from the arraignment as we get more from the courtroom coming up. We've also just received the update from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. As I mentioned, four people have now died because of the shooting. Three more people, though, have been released from the hospital. There is some good news. But four remain still hospitalized, including a 17-year-old that we know is in critical condition, a 14-year-old who was in critical condition but is improving. Investigators say the gun used during yesterday's shooting was bought last Friday by the shooter's father. According to Sheriff Mike Bouchard, the suspect was arrested with 18 live rounds still on him. We're also learning more about what happened before the shooting occurred. We have since learned that the schools did have contact with the student the day before and the day of the shooting for behavior in the classroom that they felt was concerning. In fact, the parents were brought in the morning of the shooting and had a face-to-face -face meeting with the school. Yeah, so the suspect, again, as we've told you, has not been cooperative with investigators, but the sheriff there revealing the parents were meeting at the school the morning of the shooting. We will continue to learn more about that, we expect. But the heartbreak keeps growing in the aftermath of the shootings. As we mentioned, we lost another student today, 17-year-old Justin Schilling. We'll be learning more about him in the near future. But we're already hearing stories about these three young people. Gone too soon, Tate Meir, Hannah St. Julianne, and uh, Madison Baldwin. Our Rod Maloney's been talking to people who knew Hannah very well. Rod? Yeah, it's Hannah, Devin, and don't mean to correct, but that's the, that is the pronunciation. We want to make sure we get that right. We're in Centennial Park here. You see the blue and orange ribbons behind me, the O strong sign just put up in the last 15 or 20 minutes. Now, we had a chance to speak to the St. Juliana family. They referred us to a few houses down from them to very close family friends. They're the Curtises. They live just a couple of doors down. Their families could not be any closer. And the Curtises spoke to us today in very emotional fashion. She was just a kind kid. Never heard her say anything bad about anybody or act out. Just a, a beautiful young lady inside and out. She just cared about people. Jennifer and Shannon Curtis of Ortonville considered Hannah one of their own. Their children so close to her that they would bring Hannah up north to their Thumb Lake family cottage on weekends or weeks at a time. She had uh, a big, bright smile, and um, and I can't believe that. I can't believe she's not here. They'd host neighborhood backyard ball games. Hannah, a good volleyball player as a freshman who also played basketball, was always ready for a game. The families even roasted chestnuts together two weeks ago. 
But yesterday, as they stood outside the Meyer store with the St. Juliana family, the crushing blow came. Sheriff's deputies telling Hannah's parents that she wasn't there for pickup. She'd been murdered. It was the um, saddest, most difficult thing I've ever done. The most single, gut-wrenching experience of my life. As for what Oxford is without today in Hannah's absence. Her big heart, just unbelievable desire and will to, um, to help anyone. Well, the flags are at half staff here today at Centennial Park. The Curtises are concerned and want very much for there to be proper memorials, not only for Hana, but for all of the victims. And here on Friday night, there's supposed to be a tree lighting in their memory, and the Curtises believe that's a very good start. Reporting live in Oxford, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Yeah, all right, Rod, and I appreciate the correction on the pronunciation of Hana's name. And while we're at it, yesterday, we, uh, I believe we at first we were uh, mispronouncing the name of uh, Tate Meir. We weren't sure if it was Meyer or Meir. All of these... Uh, all of these victims, of course, deserve to have their names uh, pronounced correctly and remembered appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rod. Meantime, the entire community continues to band together to support the victims, the survivors, and their families. Dozens gathered this morning for morning mass at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Lake Orion. Several local churches had prayer vigils last night. We showed you those on Local 4 News at 11. Many continue offering support today. For some members, this tragedy just hits too close to home. A dear friend of my grandson was one of the victims that passed away. And my heart just breaks for all the families of the victims. And um, I hope our prayers strengthen them to get through this horrible tragedy. K through eight school at St. Joseph Catholic Church was closed today as teachers were receiving crisis training. That's the former school, by the way, of one of the victims, Tate Meir. There are so many stories out there from so, so many families who've been affected uh, by this shooting. Karen Drew has been uh, talking to so many different people and a number of students are also sharing their stories with her. Karen. I'm Karen Drew in Oxford. I just got done talking with two survivors from yesterday's school shooting. I sit down and talk with them about what went on inside that high school. They share images of what happened during lockdown and text messages from their parents where they say both doors are barricaded. The father says, listen, always go by run, hide, fight in that order. They respond, they are tugging at our door. We'll be hearing from them. Plus, these girls also knew one of the victims. If you ask anyone from Oxford, Tate would be the guy to go after the gunman. He would be the one to save everyone's lives, like put everyone's lives before his. Our coverage continues at five and six from Oxford. Back to you. All right, Karen, all over Metro Detroit school safety, getting a second and third look in the aftermath of what happened in Oxford. A very sad reality that many of our children have been trained and prepared to deal with the situation we saw yesterday. Paula Tutman uh, jo no, joining us now live with the, more on this video that's circulating, uh, showing that training in action, Paula. Yeah, so Devin, you can just take a look around this classroom and know that if you are involved in an active shooter situation, this kind of setting can become a fishbowl or a barrel. I've been talking to a lot of superintendents today and a lot of experts, of course, they are hurting. They are devastated. Whether this is their school district or not, this affects absolutely all of us. But one thing that I'm hearing a lot about is that these students, because of their training, were able to save their own lives and likely a lot of others. This video that was taken inside one of the Oxford classrooms yesterday is evidence to many that at least some of these students were trained in active shooter protocols. Sheriff's office, safe to come out. Someone calls out, Sheriff's office, safe to come out. Yeah, he said it's safe to come out. The students don't buy that answer. Now we're not willing to take that risk right now. I can't hear you. We're not taking that risk right now. And that's a dangerous mistake, according to Oakland University's police chief, Mark Gordon, who runs the university's run, hide, fight training for students. The response from inside may have been just something that they reacted to. I would have instructed during training to remain quiet so that the shooter or whoever is knocking on the door believes there's no one in the room. So that's part of trying to 
make the shooter move on to another area because they doesn't think anybody's in the room. But these students also assess what they believe to be a bigger danger by not associating those words. Okay, well, come to the door and look at my bag, bro. No. Yeah, bro. He said bro. He said bro. He said bro. Red flag. Outside the room as being from law enforcement or safe. And our expert says that means their reaction was right. What they did right was the door was secured, it looked like it was barricaded, and they did not open the door when it said Sheriff's Department, open the door. You never would do that. Chief Gordon says that these students showed Go. the training works. Not explaining, not talking, but actual, deliberate, intentional training. It works. We know training works from previous shooting incidents that have occurred, that when you train to a specific goal, it is recalled quicker. You cannot make up preparedness. You cannot make up a response, an appropriate response during an emergency. You have to have training and there has to be a memory of what you're supposed to do. And part of the memory is of acting out or scenario-based training of what that looks like so that your brain remembers and recalls what to do during an emergency. But what could have happened without that level of training, without that ingraining? Generally, the scene becomes more chaotic. People don't know what to do. There's no coordinated response or response to the, the threat that is presented to you. And more casualties generally result in that type of situation. Slow down, you're fine. Okay, so in his news conference just a little while ago, Oakland County Sheriff uh, Mike Bouchard actually addressed that voice outside of the classroom. He says he places one of his investigators there and who was changing his language it's called coding. In other words, to try to make the students feel more comfortable. But this is what the experts say. Kids didn't trust it. They believed that they were still in danger. Therefore, they did the right thing. And that was to not open that door and to get out of there. Devin? Exactly right. All right, Paula. And coming up here at 5, we will have more of the minute-by-minute -minute account of how this shooting and the arrest played out, including more on this quick reaction that likely saved many lives. At 6, friends of Tate Meir describing him as you heard earlier, as the one person they knew would put himself in harm's way to save someone else. We've been posting updates at clickondetroit.com. Our coverage continues both here and online. All right, still ahead here on First at Four, keeping a close eye on Michigan's latest COVID surge and hearing about the first confirmed Omicron case in the United States. That's coming up a little later. Could Roe versus Wade be overturned? The justices heard arguments today for about 90 minutes. We'll talk about some of the questions they ask, what that might be telling us when we come back. First, let's check in with Paul Gross. Paul. Hey, Devin. Uh, right now, temperatures averaging right around 40 degrees across the area. The wind is light. We may see a couple of drops this evening, but a nice warm-up for tomorrow. The thing is, it's going to be temporary. We'll time that out for you straight ahead. Today at 6. I heard like a gunshot from behind me, and everyone is just screaming, run. Hear from two teens who were inside when the Oxford High School shooting on